both through me and in spite of me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I was thinking that we would begin this morning with a moment of deep interpersonal sharing. I was thinking that we would begin this morning with a bit of communal vulnerability. And I, I phrase it like that because the information I want you to share with us is potentially very psychologically revealing. So specifically what I'm going to ask you to share it is an injustice, a small injustice in your life that you find unduly irksome. I'm talking about those petty little situations that we all run into in the course of our lives that for whatever reason, they just really, they get our goat. They grind our gears. They get under our skin in a really big, big way. So first what's going to happen, I'm going to share my example. And then I'm going to invite any brave souls in the audience to share theirs. If you're joining us online, you can feel free to share it in the chat box. I'll read it to everybody uh, from my phone. And as always, there is no pressure for you to share. Just, just do know that the success of this sermon hinges on your participation. So no pressure. No pressure whatsoever. Uh, so for me, th th this petty little situation that just irks me so much is when you're standing in a really long grocery line. You're in the checkout line at the store, and it's just going so painfully, slowly. Everybody up ahead is using an assortment of coupons, some expired, some unexpired, and they're fighting with the clerk. Everybody's paying with cash, and they're doing that thing where they're like, okay, if I give you 23 cents, you can give me 4K back or whatever. I don't know what people do. It's 2022, get a debit card. Let's move things along a little bit. But you're just going so slowly through that line. And already I'm aggravated. My blood pressure is going to the roof. And I'm just thinking, Lord, if the rapture really is a thing, just take me now. Or better yet, take the people in front of me and I can move through line a little bit faster. But then, right? But then, like a beacon of hope and light in this dark world of ours, Another cashier comes to open up the next lane over. Yeah. Things are looking good. Things are looking real good. They do the whole rigmarole of starting up the register, and they're getting ready to open. I'm ready to make my move, and they flip the light. When out of nowhere, some joker fresh out of the aisles comes, and they pop their stuff right on the checkout counter, and the clerk says nothing about it. Now, now, this is the psychologically revealing part. Uh, the truth is that I don't care if that person is an 80-year-old woman in a wheelchair on oxygen. In that moment, I am fit to be tied. I don't care who it is. Right? I find it unduly irksome. So I know that I cannot be the only peevish person in this congregation. I know for a fact that my family's watching, and I come by this peevishness honestly. So at the very least, they should be sharing something in the chat box. Uh, but who has a, a similar type of situation that they might be willing to, to share with us this morning? Oh, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Here, Jim, let me give you a microphone really quick. Just so people can hear what you have to say. So vulnerable. Safe space, Jim. Safe space. I think it's a valid concern. I'm talking about impatient or unkind drivers. Have you ever tried to stop to parallel park and somebody blocks you? You can't get in the spot. Somebody honks at you because you're lost and you're trying to make a right somewhere. That was all. Or even worse, you know when people are zigging through traffic and you're like, oh, I'll pass them in a couple minutes because traffic's heavy, but yet they get ahead. They manage to get ahead. Oh. Sorry, go ahead, Mary. <clears throat> Mine is when you really have to um, use the restroom and you go upstairs and you, door and you lift up the toilet and the person who used the bathroom before you forgot to flush. Oh. And it's just a surprise and you surprise you're just so Marietta, angry. Surprise. You you're go. just so angry. The injustice, the injustice <laughs> in this world is overwhelming. Dave, were you raising your hand? No. Yeah. Julie's always good for a grievance. 
What do you got? <laughs> um, we frequently go north to Boston to look for birds, and we go up Route 93, and there's this wonderful lane that opens up at Montdale Avenue. There's a dotted line, and you can get in it to go right on to 95 north, and a lot of people stay in the lane left of that and sneak right in right at the last minute. So that's kind of aggravating because that's oh. not the way you're supposed to do it. <laughs> Unjust. Unjust. Paul? I don't know if this counts, but I can't stand lukewarm water. Oh yeah, that counts. Yeah, you want hot water, you hop in the shower and it's lukewarm. Oh yeah, that's awful. Or how about when someone gets in the shower before you, uses all the hot water, so you have to take a lukewarm shower. Ugh. Oh, See, this is a very peevish congregation. I'm surprised this is all you had to share. Uh, nobody seems to be, you know, nothing. Nothing from the, the audience at home. So that, that oh, Ben, thank you. I have a little, an old work story. I was driving an ice cream truck when I was in college. And uh, while I was getting out the, the uh, ice cream from the back of the truck, someone got in and took my cash box. So I ended up at the end of the day back at the plant without a cash box. And um, of course, the owner refused to pay me uh, for anything. And he said, did you call the police? And I said, no, I couldn't see. The kids were all around, people were running away. I, I didn't, so he said, well, that's tough. Uh -huh. No no pay today. And the, what was in the cash box is held against you. So I felt, I felt that was unfair. Both unfair and illegal. That's, <laughs> your labor laws, that was, yeah. Wow, man, that's a, that was a, actually a big injustice that Ben just shared. Uh, does anyone else want to want their? Does anyone else want their turn at the mic? The floodgates have opened. Well, what bothers me is sometimes when you're in a restaurant and a patron is just so rude to a waiter or a waitress, no matter what the situation is, you know, just like kind of show a little bit more patience and understanding, and you know, we don't know what they're going through either. So exactly, yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, so are you, are you feeling sufficiently riled, right? Are, are you feeling that injustice, these petty injustices? Are you feeling that indignation at all these various situations? Are you getting your back up a little? You want to say, how, how dare you, right, to the folks who, who caused all these situations? I want, I want to stick with that feeling for just a second. Because that, that feeling is at the very heart of today's teaching from chapter 20 of the Gospel of Matthew. Because what this parable of Jesus is saying is that God's love is a profoundly unfair thing. What this parable is saying is that God's love is like standing in a grocery line for a really long time and you're about to go to the next lane over, and someone cuts you off. What this parable is saying is, is that God's love is like going to park, to parallel park your car, and someone zips in and takes your spot. What this parable is saying is that God's love is like going to use the restroom, and you discover that the person before you didn't, didn't flush. What this parable is saying is God's love is like going to take a shower and you found that the person before you used up all the hot water so you have to take a lukewarm shower. It's like trying to merge onto a highway and no one will let you. It's like going to a restaurant and someone's tearing down the, the waitress and they're getting served just as well as you are. What this parable is saying is that God's love is a profoundly profoundly unfair thing. And moreover, what this parable is saying is that Martin Luther King and Ted Bundy, Mother Teresa, 
Vladimir Putin, you, that old woman who cut you off at the checkout line, you are all equally deserving recipients of God's love. Ew. Hey, how do you like them apples? Doesn't feel so good, does it? And ironically, ironically, it's exactly us good, wholesome, church-going folk who have the hardest time wrapping our minds around this aspect of God's love. But that actually makes a lot of sense if you think about this parable. Because in the parable that Jesus shares, each of the workers in the vineyard, both the, the person who worked all the live long day and the person who only put in a couple minutes of work, they both get paid the same at the end of the day. So the only significant difference between the two is that the former believed that they were just getting what they were owed, while the latter understood their reward to be a gift. To be a gift. And so it is exactly good, wholesome, church-going folk like us. While all of our friends are out at brunch right now, downing mimosas, right? Here we are in church, meditating on 2,000-year-old teachings, trying to make ourselves better, trying to think how we can go out and help our neighbors better, how to make our world a better and more habitable place for all of God's children, for all of God's creation. Well, there are people out there right now actively working to make the world a worse kind of place. So for church-going folk like us, it can feel like we're putting it in all the work. And so God's love can feel less like a gift and more like payment received for services rendered. Amen? There is a, a radio host slash seminary professor, and I think he is also a pastor too, uh, who has this great story uh, to help church folk like you and me wrap our minds around this aspect of God's love. So the story that he likes to tell is about a, about a time when he was eight years old, and his dad was trying to teach him how to use one of those old-timey two-person saws. You know what I'm talking about? So what, what they were doing is they had some woods behind their house. Uh, so they were just going around to various trees that had already fallen down, and they were just practicing using the saw. Just cutting this log and cutting that log, and they're having a good time. But eventually they, they cut through one log, and the round that falls off, Brian looks at it. Did I mention the guy's name is Brian? The guy's name is Brian. He, he looks at this round, and, and the inside of this log is rotten. It has a rotten core, but it just so happens that this rotten core is in the shape of a horse head. It looks just like a horse's head. And the moment he sees that, he's just struck with, with inspiration. So when his dad's not looking, he takes that and he tucks it in his jacket for later. And a little bit later, when they get home, Brian goes off to the garage uh, to make a present for his father. So this is what he does. He, he grabs a, a length of two by four, and to that two by four, he affixes the, that horse head, that rotten horse head piece of wood. So now he has a horse head, and he has a horse body. He then goes out to his backyard. He grabs four sticks of various lengths. He comes back in. He affixes them to either end. He now has a horse head, a horse body, and four horse legs attached to this thing, but he is not done yet. He then goes and gets some twine. He untwines the twine, gets some super glue, and sticks it on the butt. So he now has a horse's head, a horse's body, four horse legs, and a horse's tail, but he's still not done. What he does next is he grabs some nice long nails, about eight or ten of them, and down the length of that two by four that is the horse's body, he drives them in just about halfway into the wood so they're protruding out. And the kid is eight years old, so we have to imagine that they're going every which way. I'm 37 years old, and every time I use a hammer, they're going in every which way still. And then when he drove that last nail in, he said, aha, I am done. He went and he got some butcher paper. He wrapped it up. 
And he went and took it to his father. He said, Dad, I made something for you. He did. Takes it and, and, and he opens it up. And he does what any good parent would do. And that would be to say, oh my gosh, buddy. Oh, wow, this is so great. Oh, this is so wonderful. Oh, you're so artistic and so smart. This is so wonderful. Oh, uh, what is it? To which eight-year-old Brian replied, it is a horse tie rack. A tie rack that looks like a horse. Dad, ain't that cool? And his father said, yes, it is. And he took it and he put it up on his clock and he used it for years and years and years. Now, if you had asked eight-year-old Brian, he would have told you that this work of art he made for his father was an objectively good thing, an objectively beautiful thing, an objectively useful thing. It was a work of art fitting to be displayed at the MFA down there in Boston, according to eight-year-old Brian. But as he grew up, as he matured, as he gained perspective, he came to realize that that tie rack that he made for his father was in fact quite ugly, and in fact barely usable of those eight nails sticking out of the length of it. Only two could actually support a tie without it slipping off. And yet his father used it for years and years and years. Which is to say that his father wasn't using it because it was inherently good, inherently beautiful, inherently useful. No, no, his father was using it, right, because he loved his child. And out of his love for his child, he made use of this decrepit little gift he gave them, even though objectively, it wasn't much to write home about. Now, you can probably see where I'm going. The truth is, if we look at, at all those activities that we do that we think make us deserving of God's love, that make us feel like we have earned God's love and set us apart from other people, we would have to admit, they're probably not quite as perfect as we think they are. So I, I think specifically of the, the Friday Cafe over there in Cambridge. I think most folks here know what it is. Actually, most of you have probably already volunteered over there. Uh, but in its own words, the Friday Cafe is a, a neighborhood meeting spot where, where housed and unhoused folks can get together to break bread together in community. When it came on the scene seven years ago, all, all the other Cambridge soup kitchens that were serving like 100, 120 people a day, the Friday Cafe burst on the scene and they were serving 150 to 350 people a day. It's just absolutely crazy the work they're doing over there. When the pandemic came around, other programs shut down, but the question that the Friday Cafe asked was not, should we keep going through the pandemic, but was, how can we keep going? So they moved their operations outside and they missed a couple days through the pandemic, but that's only because of bad weather, right? So that, if that sounds like a, a beautiful, really Christian kind of program, yeah, it absolutely is. But is it perfect? No, it is not. Because if you have ever worked with volunteers before, Lord have mercy, you'll know how fussy and horrible working with volunteers can be. Because just as the guests of the Friday's Cafe show up with their brokenness, so too are the volunteers to the program showing up with their brokenness. So you have these volunteers who are gonna be short-tempered with each other. You have these volunteers who are gonna be rude to the very guests that they are there to serve. You're gonna have these volunteers, you give them a little job to do, and, and this is their first time there, and all of a sudden they become really territorial. And if someone comes over and tries to assist them with the task, they, they smack their hands away. No, this is my job. Stay away. And then you have people who are just weirdly, weirdly particular in what they are willing to do and what they are not willing to do. So you have folks show up and say, oh, yeah, I want to I help serve food. I want to help serve on the food line. And you say, great. Uh, but they're like, except 
I'm only willing to serve soup, and I'm not willing to serve macaroni salad. What? Why is that a thing? How is that a thing? I don't know, but it is a real dynamic that pops up there week after week after week. And yet that program is serving so many people and doing so much good in the world. And while it's much harder for us to recognize our own brokenness, our own weirdness, our own territorialness, our own particularness about what we're willing to do and we're, we're not willing to do. If we got some perspective on the situation, we would see that all this labor that we are doing that we think makes us worthy, more worthy of God's love than other people. You know, we'd see, you know, it's really not all that much to write home about. Which is all just a very, very, very long way of saying is that, that, that God's love is not something that we earn for ourselves by virtue of all the, the majestically carved teak stallions that, that we lay at God's feet in the form of our worship and our service. But rather, God's love is a gift to us, given to us to work in and through our lives despite, despite the, those rotten, horse-head, decrepit, horse tyrex we keep lobbing God's way. And what can the people of God say but thanks be to God for that? Amen.